So we are going to get started with nutrition. So why do we eat? Don't say to live. Talked about it last week, actually, the gastrointestinal system. Why do we eat? Question open to anyone. Maybe you have your microphone turned off. You're trying to answer right now. Maybe you don't care. Why do we eat? We eat for the nutrients. Why do we need the nutrients? To make things. What are the two things we make more than anything else? Energy and protein. Two things we make it more than anything else. Energy and protein. So we got to get those nutrients coming in so that we can make those things. That's the purpose of eating. Okay, I'm going to move into the slides then, if you're ready. So you should see the slides now. Chapter 22, Nutrition and Metabolism. Mm. Nutrition and metabolism. Nutrition referring to the foods we eat and the type of nutrients that they will contain. And of course, they're going to have uh, lots of different things that we need and some things that we don't need and some things that we can't break down. So things that we can break down and absorb, we're going to break down and absorb. Things we cannot break down or not absorb, we're going to continue to go on through. Notice the definition of malnutrition, deficiency or imbalance. That's an important thing to understand because malnutrition doesn't just mean the person doesn't have enough food to eat because they might have plenty of food to eat. In fact, they might have too much food to eat, but there's an imbalance in the types of nutrients they're getting. In other words, they're getting a lot of bad stuff, not a lot of good stuff. That would be a fast food type of a diet. Plenty of food to eat. It's not really food. It's just chocolate cake disguised as something else. It's an important thing to understand. Uh, they call these macronutrients. You'll hear me refer to them as macromolecules of nutrition. Uh, macronutrients is uh, actually a much more efficient way of saying it. But you'll still hear me say macromolecules of nutrition. And I'll say the three that we all sort of agree upon, that everybody agrees upon, are macromolecules, are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Water, yes, it is a macromolecule of nutrition. But I kind of put it in its own category because water has that unique property that it can move across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Something called osmosis. You may have heard of this.
So I sort of put water in its own unique category. And I like to keep the minerals all together under the micronutrients, the micromolecules nutrition. But like I said, the one thing that everybody agrees upon are the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins fall under the category of macromolecules. And vitamins, everybody agrees that vitamins and, and minerals, to some extent, fall under the micromolecules and nutrients utilized in a lot of biological pathways and a lot of the biochemical pathways, where we'll see those as enzymes or uh, cofactors in some of the bio, biochemistry. Okay. All right, now, we talked about metabolism. Oh, pardon for one moment. Well, Sorry about that. I thought I was going to sneeze and get a grab of tissue. Um, <laughs> We talked about metabolism and we've seen the definition of metabolism a couple of times now. All of these things that are occurring in our bodies that keep our body functioning, especially at the cellular level. And Again, uh, a definition is a good thing to know, but really being able to understand it, understand metabolism. This is why early on, you remember metabolism looked like the engine of a car with those things going into it, like fuel, and air and spark. And the more you put in, the faster the engine would run. And then of course, uh, in the process of running the engine, we'd end up with exhaust waste product that we'd have to get rid of. And then we end up with a byproduct of heat with the cells. The cells are making these things, especially energy and proteins more than anything else. So we have to put things into them. The more things that we're able to put in, the faster those cells can do their job. So the more nutrients they can get, the better they can operate, the more efficiently they can operate. If they are lacking in any of those ingredients coming in, glucose, oxygen, and water especially, then the metabolism slows down. Whatever that cell was supposed to be doing slows down. All cells create heat as a byproduct. Again, this is something that the books don't really make clear. They really focus on the skeletal muscle. And although skeletal muscle can make a great deal of heat, it's not the only thing that creates heat, so FYI. Bottom line, it's, it's much more important to understand what metabolism is than just memorize a single definition. Because it's going to be, as you can see, there's we've seen a couple of different definitions for it now. So it's really much better to understand metabolism. And I think I mentioned that way back in week two or three. Assimilation, when some of these things are absorbed into the cells, and participate or in some way um, are altered maybe to become a part of the cell or one of the things that are created by the cell. It's simple, straightforward. A couple more simple, straightforward definitions. We've talked about these before, catabolism and anabolism. Anabolism, synthesis, Anabolism is building things up. Catabolism is breaking things down. Much simpler way of putting it in.
catabolism, breaking things down, anabolism, building things up. So when, uh, when did I use this? Uh, with regard to proteins, I said that as we take in proteins, we have to break them down into their individual uh, building blocks, those amino acids so that we can absorb them. And then once we can absorb them, then the liver will, liver will decide what to do with them. So we build them back up again or put them in storage, build them into different proteins as the anabolism part. And I said, we make two things more than anything else, energy and proteins, mostly energy. The energy is the ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That is the energy molecule that our cells make and then use and then make and use and make and use. They make it, use it, 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 make it, use it. So on the top here, you see that ATP, the adenosine with the three inorganic phosphates attached. And this bond right here is the, is the powerful one. So that last phosphate. When that bond gets broken, there we are. There is a release of energy to do something. And now we end up with ADP plus inorganic phosphate all by itself. So we got to build it back up again. So you may have heard the saying, it takes money to make money. Yeah, it takes energy to make energy, typically. So ATP, we've heard about this before. Something you need to know about. Okay, saccharides. Saccharides are sugar. If it's by itself, simple sugar, like glucose, fructose, then we call it a monosaccharide. If it is two sugars stuck together, like sucrose or lactose, we call those disaccharides. If there are lots of sugars stuck together, those are carbohydrates. We call those polysaccharides, especially when they are long branch chain sugar stuck together. We call those carbohydrates. Remember, carbohydrates are not innately fattening. Carbohydrates don't make you fat. Not in and of themselves. In fact, about 65% of your diet that should be made up of carbohydrates. Approximately 65%. So we have to have them. Problem is people take in too many of them. That's the issue with carbohydrates. Good things to know though. Remember if it's a sugar, it's gonna end in os. Cause that's the rule. If it's a sugar, it ends in os. If it's an enzyme, it ends in as. And again, when I talk about these rules, I mean, you're always going to, those are the 90% rules. And 90% are good enough for me. Because there's always going to be the exceptions, but 90% is good enough for me. Okay. I talked about glucose as this fuel that our body uses a 
kind of likening it to a lump of coal that we have to burn in order to make energy. And that's kind of the simplified version of it. And we know the mitochondria is where energy is made. And the glucose has to get into the cell. But once the glucose gets into the cell, then it has to go through a process. Then it has to go through a change before it can even get into the mitochondria. We're going to keep it in the cytoplasm. And we are going to take it through this process of anaerobic change. We're going to change glucose. We're going to change glucose into pyruvate, or as you can see here, pyruvic acid. And in fact, we're going to take one molecule of glucose and change it into two molecules with pyruvate. And you'll have to excuse me because I'm still going to say pyruvate, but it's the same thing as pyruvic acid. Those terms are interchangeable. So why do we want to make glucose into these two molecules? Because glucose has is a six carbon molecule and pyruvates are three carbon molecules. Well, they are going to go on to create more things that we are going to use later on in the citric acid cycle. or as you'll hear me call it the Krebs cycle, or sometimes you'll hear other people call it the TCA or tricarboxylic acid cycle. All means the same thing, is this is going to create components that we'll use to create energy. So when I say that glucose is used in making energy, that's the a simplified, version of it. We've got to break it down and take every glucose molecule and break it into pyruvates. And each pyruvate goes through this process where it is going to, and you can see here creating carbon dioxide as waste. Um, it shows here in the first anaerobic part, this is happening in the cytoplasm. Let's say that somewhere right here. No. Uh, the, there is a release of energy. But what they're not showing you is that there's also an input of energy in order to, for this to happen. Like I said, you got to make energy to use energy. You know, you got to make it, you got to use energy to make energy. It's like you gotta, it takes money to make money, it takes energy to make energy. So they're not really showing you here that there is an energy input. And the first step, in changing glucose to pyruvates, is to phosphorylate it. We change it to glucose 6 phosphate. And then there are several steps along the way. This is what we call glycolysis, this breakdown of glucose. Turns it into those three carbon pyruvates enters the as they call it the citric acid cycle yeah this is the part that's happening like i said in the uh, mitochondria and then now that we've created these components from the citric acid cycle, we are going to utilize them in the production of more ATP, more energy. 
So this is occurring inside of the mitochondria. And you might recall the mitochondria has two membranes, an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And this is occurring across the inner membrane. This is referred to as the electron transport chain. Way down here, there we are. So if you're thinking, well, this looks kind of complicated. Yeah, it is a bit. In fact, and they're really, they're not even showing everything that's involved here. I'm actually just seeing that now. They're leaving a few things out, but notice that they're starting up here with the uh, NADH2. So there's an NADH plus another H, NADH2. And it gets broken down to NAD. These high energy electrons are going to get moved down this complex, down this chain, excuse me, through these complexes. And what that's going to do is that's going to take protons and force them across this inner membrane. So we have protons moving from here to here. And as we continue down, we're building up these groups of protons. And what's going to happen is they're going to get to this protein right here, ATP synthase. And those protons are going to move through that channel. They're going to zip on through. And as they do, that is going to cause adenosine diphosphate to add this extra inorganic phosphate and create ATP. Just that simple. Yeah, it really is not simple. It's quite complicated. Uh, I, I think the best way that I, I, I don't even know it's the best way. The way I see, what I see happening here and again, I, I may have mentioned this already. This reminds me of a like a very tall slide and kids lining up to climb the ladder to slide down the slide. So the hydrogens, the protons here, like the kids lining up. And as the kids slide down the slide, they're creating energy, right? They're, um, that, that movement can be changed into energy if it needed to. Uh, but as these protons come zipping down, that creates that ATP by joining inorganic phosphate to an ADP. And you'll notice something else. Water is also formed here. I'll mention that a while back. So utilizing glucose to make energy, I start out with a pretty simple explanation. The glucose, we call it cell sugar. We call it cell sugar because that sugar has to go into the cell. And insulin is going to carry it into the cell. Well, it's going to, not going to carry it. It's going to open up the door for it and shove it in. And then glucose, once it's in the cell, can be utilized to make ATP. Specifically with the mitochondria. But it has to go. It has to go through a change first. And I wish they would have included a better image of 
glycolysis happening here. This first step looks like it's pretty simple. Glucose becomes pyruvate. It is not simple. There are several changes that occur uh, as glucose goes through here. And each one of those changes requires some kind of enzyme. In other words, a protein that is going to help it go through all of these changes. So it really is not as simple, it's really not as simple as glucose becomes pyruvate. Uh, the first step, they, they mentioned glucose becoming glucose 6-phosphate. But then there's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven more steps. I believe there's seven more steps before it becomes pyruvate. Hold on one second, let me check here. Okay. Yes, glucose requires ATP and hexokinase or glucokinase to become glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate is converted to fructose 6-phosphate using phosphoglucose isomerase. Fructose 6-phosphate becomes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate with the rate limiting enzyme phosphofructokinase 1. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate then splits into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate becomes 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenolpyruvate to finally pyruvate. Each one of those steps requiring a uh, different enzyme. And that's just to get down to pyruvate. That doesn't even take us into the citric acid cycle, which again requires several steps and several enzymes. So the more you start to study this, the more you realize that this gets pretty complicated, but the more you also realize that we have a lot of enzymes. Uh, and of course, enzymes are types of proteins that have to be made. And if they're not made, then some of these processes can't be, can't happen. They, they, uh, they won't happen. I should uh, print out glycolysis. I'll test you on that, that would be fun. Not fun for you, you would hate it. All right, so the electron transport chain, this is where it's our left off factor. And all of this, all this stuff that was happening, all of these several steps of glycolysis and the several steps of the Krebs cycle, all to finally get down to this level where all we want to do is get those protons pushed to the other side of the inner mitochondrial membrane just so they'll come zipping on back through again. Because once they come zipping on through that protein down here, ATP synthase, well, then we're going to have, then we're going to have ATP being created right there. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Okay, let's go down to the control of glucose metabolism. Understand that 
we store glucose in a number of ways. We can store it as fat. We can store it as glycogen. Oh no, where I said glycogen is the quick storage, like the hall closet quick storage form of glucose. Or we can store it as glucose in our blood. Now, blood is usually just for transport. I think we talked about that before. Uh, that's the main, main job of blood is to transport things. And it is transporting glucose around, which is, well, I think we'd all agree that's a pretty important thing to do, transport the glucose around. but it's also got to get delivered into the cells. But we have to keep a certain amount of glucose in the blood. So when those cells start calling out saying they need glucose, they don't have to wait very long. It'll be nearby. You probably remember me saying things like uh, if the cell starts running low on glucose, it'll send out a signal. You may also remember we talked about hormones, and I said hormones are chemical signals, whereas nerves send electrical signals, hormones are chemical signals. That tend to have a longer lasting the message. So those are the hormones are some of the main things that control how much sugar is glucose is in the blood at any given time. Although it's not really blood sugar, it's more cell sugar because that's where it needs to go. It's got to go into the cells. But I do want you to note these terms here, hyperglycemic and hypoglycemic. Glyco means sugar. Emia means in the blood. Like, um, sorry, hyper more than, hypo less than. So you gotta be able to see words like this and know the definition, not because you memorize the definition, but because you can break that word down. Emia is in the blood. Glyco means sugar. And hyper is more than, hypo is less than. Important that you can see these words and break them down. This goes back to day one. Medical terminology, yes. Can you let Erica in, please? She didn't show up. I'm sorry, not Erica, Shannon. Shannon, yeah. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. She didn't show up either, but she's here now. No problem. That's not what I want. Thanks for letting me know. All right. Okay, now let's use just a little bit of uh, logic to follow these steps. Let me move this over a little bit actually, because we're not gonna worry about the releasing hormones too much. These things are gonna raise blood glucose level. So now why would you wanna raise blood sugar level? Well, 
maybe the body needs more energy for some reason. Or maybe it's just low overall in blood sugar. So these hormones are ones that are going to increase it. We talked about glucagon from the alpha cells of the pancreas, those islets of Lagerhan cells, the alpha cells produce glucagon. Glucagon is going to cause uh, the return of glucose from glycogen. Remember, we're gonna store glucose in the quick storage form glycogen. So it's gonna say, come on, we need that glucose back again, put it back and then put it in the blood. Growth hormone is eventually going to cause any cell that's capable of growing to grow. Remember I said there's that other step in between, but don't worry so much about that because as long as you know that growth hormone eventually will cause every cell that is capable of growing to grow. Well, in order to grow, we need energy. So it would make sense that if growth hormone is released, there's going to be growing occurring, which means building, which means energy is required. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. This is gonna be released during times of fight or flight. Remember the sympathy, sympathetic division of the peripheral nervous system fight or flight, which means you're going to put up your dukes or run away. And if you're going to run away, well, it's going to fight too. But if you're going to do something like that, you're going to need energy. Things are going to move faster. Heart's going to beat faster. Muscles are going to be utilized more. So you're going to need more energy. It means put more glucose in the blood. And cortisol is the glucocorticoid that we talked about that helps to uh, go through the process of breaking down some proteins. And in order to do that, we need energy. It also sort of helps decide where we're going to, how much we're going to have in the blood and when we're going to have in the blood, uh, when we're going to need it the most. All this, So of these four, the first three definitely make sense to you. And those are kind of the most important ones that I want you to know about. So what's going to lower blood glucose? Well, remember the pancreas and those islets of Lagerhans cells, specifically the beta cells, are going to produce the hormone insulin. And insulin is the delivery guy. It's going to take glucose by the hand and take it to the cells that need it. So it's going to move glucose out of the blood and into the cells. Or it's going to move it to a place like storage cells. So it's going to take it out of the blood and move it into storage. So it's going to lower blood glucose levels. So hopefully, these things are making a little bit of sense right now. If you understand why we need glucose. And you can see some of the releasing hormones and things that are going to trigger the release of those. But like I said, they're not going to worry about that as much. Triglycerides. Oh, these are the fats, lipids. Triglycerides. Glycerol subunit with those three fatty acids. Remember, we saw them as a long line of carbon atoms that have hydrogens attached to them. And they are saturated or unsaturated, meaning they have all their hydrogens, sorry, they have all their carbons filled up with hydrogens. That is a saturated fat. 
that makes a nice straight chain. Whereas the unsaturated fats have carbon atoms that are missing hydrogens, which creates double bonds between the carbons, which causes a kink in the chain. Those are the ones that are fluid at room temperature. Whereas the saturated fats can stack on top of each other very nicely, making them solids at room temperature. Phospholipids. Why are these important? Remember, these are what make up the cell membranes. Remember that, that uh, double layer membrane of our cells that has those little parts that look like hairpins almost, the round part with the two straight, well, one straight, one kinked little leg off of it. And of course, a really important uh, addition to that is cholesterol. Cholesterol is a molecule that we make. Very little of our total cholesterol actually comes from our diet. Most cholesterol that we have in our body is there because we've created it. We make it. And we need it. We need cholesterol. It's good. Every cell membrane is going to have cholesterol as a component of the cell membrane. And we also use cholesterol to make hormones, especially those steroid hormones. Cholesterol is important. However, we can make too much of it. That's when it becomes a problem. That's when it builds up in areas that we don't want it to build up. Those arteries it creates plaques, fatty streaks, clots. Not good. The medications that we use for the patients that are making too much cholesterol are often referred to as the statin drugs. Those medications stop the production of cholesterol. or I should say, decrease it, not stop it, but they decrease it. So the person makes less cholesterol. They do not take cholesterol and remove it from the body. They do not block the absorption of cholesterol from the foods that we eat. They're stopping the patient's body from making as much cholesterol. So that's just me reiterating the fact that we make cholesterol. We're supposed to, important. And of course, you know, if we need to make fat molecule like this, uh, taking in dietary fats will help. So if a person's already making a lot of cholesterol, we will tell them decrease the amount of fat in your diet because that'll also help decreasing the production of cholesterol and increase the amount of fiber in your diet. First of all, most people aren't getting enough fiber in their diet anyway, but that's going to help uh, get rid of some extra cholesterol. Remember, uh, saturated fats, solid at room temperature, unsaturated or fluid at room temperature. Help you remember which, is, which one you want in your body. Think about it. Which one do you want in your blood? Do you want solid fats in your blood? Do you want fluid fats? So it makes sense that fluid fats are gonna be easier to move around. So it's just a way to kind of remember which is the good one. Saturated or bad? unsaturated are good.
although butter is pretty good, but. How do we move these fats around? Well, chylomicrons are a type of a transporter that'll move fat droplets around, help get absorbed into cells. Lipoproteins, these are the trucks that move around cholesterol. These are the ones that people talk about when they say good cholesterol and bad cholesterol because they don't understand that there's no such thing as good cholesterol or bad cholesterol. There's only cholesterol. It is neither good nor bad. However, these trucks, these lipoproteins that move cholesterol around can either take that cholesterol to where we want it to go, that's a good truck, or take cholesterol and drop it off on the side of the road, or in other words, the side of the arteries. That's a bad truck. These are lipoproteins. And when we make these trucks, these carrier trucks for uh, cholesterol, We want to make more of the good ones. Those are called high density lipoproteins. And we want to make less of the bad ones. And those are low density lipoproteins, or as you'll see them abbreviated, HDL and LDL. HDL is the good one. We want more of those. LDL is the bad one. We want less of those. Now, the good news is it's pretty simple to make more good trucks. Well, I say simple, but you know, that typically means it's probably not gonna be that simple. Um, all we have to do is exercise and eat healthy, especially lots of fresh vegetables and fruits. If we do that, we will automatically make more HDLs, more good trucks. And if we're making more high density lipoproteins, but then we aren't gonna have parts available to make low density lipoproteins. So by default, we'll make less of the bad ones. So remember, cholesterol is cholesterol. It is neither good nor bad. However, the trucks that transport it around, HDLs and LDLs, high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins, those are the things that are good or bad. And we can make more of those high density lipoproteins simply by exercising and eating healthy, especially fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. And if we make more of those good ones, by default, we'll make less of the bad ones. And then in some cases, we just see the free fatty acids moving along by themselves. Just another way to get fats through tissue from cell to cell. So stuff to know, good stuff. Obviously, what you're gonna come across the most is, um, is the conversation regarding cholesterol. So I, I really want you to understand that much about cholesterol. Yeah, okay. And yeah, we talked a little bit about some of these things already. Proteins. Proteins are made up of amino acids. Those are the building blocks. Do they have it in here? I don't think they do. I don't remember if it's in the, I think it's in the book, but I don't think it's in the slides. Um, you'll notice that sometimes they'll call amino acids 
essential or non-essential. Don't get confused by that terminology because it makes it sound like essential amino acids are ones we need, non-essential, well, those must be amino acids we don't necessarily need. That is not it at all. When we talk about essential versus non-essential amino acids, essential means these are amino acids that we have to get through our diet. Non-essential amino acids are the amino acids that our body creates, but they're just as important. These building blocks are just as important. So don't get confused by that when you hear that terminology, essential versus non-essential. Non-essential simply means our body creates those. However, there are some of those non-essential that require essential amino acids. In other words, you have to take in one amino acid in order to change it to another amino acid. And that second amino acid, if your body's creating it, then it's not essential. But if you don't have the first one, then the non-essential amino acid suddenly becomes an essential amino acid. I know it gets confusing. But don't get confused by that terminology. Do not get confused by the terminology of essential versus non-essential. Essential means it's coming from our diet, not essential, still means we need it, just as important. The difference is we are making it. Okay. We talked about proteins before, building them up, breaking them down. One of one of the um, important parts to understand with breaking down proteins is we are going to end up with some ammonia, a nitrogen that we have to get rid of, a nitrogen group that we have to get rid of. And we're gonna to have to get rid of it as something called urea. So the liver is going to take some of this ammonia that was created as a result of breaking down these proteins. And combine it in a lot of steps called the, this is called actually the urea cycle. It starts out in the mitochondria of the liver cells, and then it moves into the cytoplasm of the liver cells uh, to eventually create urea, which is then going to move to the kidneys and get filtered out of the body. So that's where a lot of our nitrogen-based waste comes from, is actually the breakdown of proteins. And of course, we're always breaking down proteins because remember, those are like things made of Lego blocks where we can break them apart and then build them back up into something else again if we need to. That's kind of important. Where do we have time here? Okay, we're good. Actually, a little early, but let's take a break. I know it's a little, a little earlier than we usually do, but let's take a break. Are there any questions? Some of this stuff should be reviewed. Some of this stuff you should be saying, sounds like we talked about this before. Yeah, we did. Oops. Okay, we'll get back into uh, nutrition then, if there are no other questions. Yep. 
So you, you heard me use the term coenzymes. They're helping out uh, in biochemical processes uh, as an assistant to enzymes. And of course, remember enzymes are proteins. Uh, they are proteins used that are gonna going to catalyze a reaction. So, We really want to get our vitamins from the foods that we eat. That's how our body absorbs them the best. There's only five times in your lives that you should be taking supplemental vitamins. And that is when you are very young. That's what the Flintstone vitamins are for. Or if you're in your elder years, that's what the one a day vitamins are for. If you are, of course, pregnant, that's what the prenatal vitamins are for. If you are deficient in a vitamin, like you've been tested and the doctor says you're missing this vitamin, or if you're in an immunocompromised state, which could mean anything from the flu to COVID to AIDS to having a cold. So those are times that you might want to get extra protein, or sorry, get extra vitamins in you. But taking the supplemental vitamins is really unnecessary. And oftentimes they don't absorb very well. So what people will say is you're just making expensive pee. When you're taking the vitamins, you're going to pee out a lot of them. The body is designed to get those things through the foods that we eat. Again, that's why we eat food. That's why we eat. We get the nutrients, including vitamins. Minerals, inorganic stuff, well, naturally in the earth. One that I think everyone, there it is, everyone is familiar with is iron you've heard of it you've heard of iron deficiencies and iron deficiency anemia so what do we need the iron for well remember that hemoglobin molecule which is the seat on the red blood cell bus has to have iron attached to it in order for it to, that seat to be useful. So considering all those red blood cells we have in our body, and there's a lot of them, and they are packed full of hemoglobin molecules, and each of those hemo, hemoglobin molecules has iron attached to the, to the globin chains, that makes sense that we're going to need iron, that's for sure. And of course, if we need iron, we're going to have places specifically designed to store iron. And you can see here the need, the requirements for iron throughout the lifetime of a male versus a female, male in blue lines, female in red. Why would pregnancy require more iron? Well, remember, when she's pregnant, she's going to have an increase in blood volume. She's going to have more red blood cells. 30% increase, maybe 40, maybe even more, maybe 50% increase. So she's going to need more red blood cells. More red blood cells means more hemoglobin, more hemoglobin, more iron. She's got to get that oxygen delivered to her uterus so the baby can steal it away. So most people are familiar with having to have iron. 
but there's other ones as well. For instance, a very important one that is required way back in that electron transport chain is copper. Most people don't realize that, yeah, we can have, we have copper in our bodies as well. And it's required at that electron transport chain. And just like with iron, uh, if there's a deficiency of it, things aren't going to work like they're supposed to. That's not common. It's not a common deficiency. But there are there is a potential for the copper to actually build up in storage. Something called Wilson's disease. And it creates these very unique uh, sort of gold colored rings in the iris of the eye called Kaiser Fleischer rings. It's kind of neat to see. But again, like anything else, we don't want too much of something to build up. Or I mean, we don't want too much iron to build up either. That's a condition called hemochromatosis because of buildup in the liver. So just an FYI, yes, we have minerals other than iron in our body as well. So if you understand metabolism, and I mean that basic understanding of running an engine and pardon me, making things, utilizing that fuel, burning it quickly, creating more waste, creating the byproduct heat, things like that. If you understand that, then metabolic rate isn't too much more difficult to understand. It refers to the amount of energy released in the body. In other words, as created. Metabolic rates are expressed either in the number of kilocalories of heat so let me first talk about what a calorie is before we talk about a thousand of them. Calorie is a unit of measurement. So it is like Fahrenheit or Celsius or pound or kilogram. It is a unit of measurement. So when people hear about uh, calories and foods and burning calories and taking in too many calories. They're not quite understanding that a calorie isn't a physical thing. It's not something you can hold in your hand. It is a unit of measurement and it is the amount, one calorie with a small c, one calorie is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. That's the technical definition of what a calorie is. The amount of energy required to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. A kilocalorie is a thousand calories. And that is how it is usually displayed on a food label. So if you are eating something and you look on the back, if you're eating a bag of chips, you look on the back of it, it has ingredients and it has the, um, so the calories listed there. You'll notice that the word calorie in that instance is with a capital C call that a dietary calorie, or that represents one kilocalorie. So it's a little bit different, but, well, not, not really different, just a different way to, rather than writing out the word kilocalorie on the back of the chips, it just has the word calorie, but it has a capital C. A capital C on calories is the same thing as a kilocalorie. Uh, 
uh, body's rate of energy expenditure under basal conditions is what we refer to as the basal metabolic rate. I guess that would kind of make sense. That's why we call it that. Awake, in other words, you're not doing anything um, extraordinary. You're not rock climbing or you're not running away from a bear. Awake but resting doesn't mean you're taking, you're like napping. Awake but resting means you're, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting, you're sitting in a seat. Post-absorptive state. So you've already eaten. You didn't just eat but you've already eaten and the food has had the opportunity to make its way through the gastrointestinal system and you've absorbed things in and you're in a comfortable environment, meaning your body is not starved for heat. So your body's not trying to make extra heat. If that makes sense. Okay. Things that change based on metabolic rate are going to depend on the size of the people. More body surface uh, means uh, there's going to be more basal metabolic rate occurring. Men typically have more muscle mass than females do. Um, also age, what others age? Okay, I was gonna say, why don't they include age? Uh, but men typically have more muscle mass. So the way that they burn fuel is gonna be different than the way the female burns fuel. Just again, in a resting, not doing anything, didn't just eat, didn't just go for a run, not really cold, so not shivering or doing anything they're just going to have a higher BMR as a result of this. This is why if you talk to any personal trainer, uh, they'll tell you as, well, actually as a male or female, um, resistance training to build extra muscle mass is always good when it comes to wanting to burn fat. If you want to have your body burning more fuel throughout the day, you can increase muscle mass and that will help with this. So it's always a good idea to include other things in training, uh, including resistance training. Some people just like to do aerobic stuff. Some people just like to do yoga. Some just like the resistance stuff. And the reality is the best thing to do is a little bit of each. Other factors, age, as I said, yes. Fever, of course. Medication, psychological, yeah, okay. Uh, coming up with the total metabolic rate requires the review of what the basal metabolic rate is. Again, looking at the skeletal muscle and thermic effects of foods. There's different foods that can change the way your body's temperature happens. Think about something like ice cream. Ice cream is wonderful, but it's cold. In fact, it's colder than the inside of your body. So your body is going to want to maintain that same temperature that is normally there. So if you're putting something colder inside of your body, your body's going to have to warm it up so it becomes the same temperature as the inside of your body. So the colder something is, 
the more the body has to work to warm it up, which means if the body's working, then it's creating, it's creating energy. It's utilizing the fuel. So you're burning calories while you're eating ice cream. Now, before you get excited, you're also putting in a lot of extra fuel, more of those quote unquote calories uh, than might be necessary. So don't think, well, that's the way I'll lose weight. I'll go on an ice cream diet, eat nothing but the coldest ice cream I can find because that really is not going to help. But people have um, experimented with things like drinking colder water because of course water is not going to add any calories but if you're drinking cold water your body has to warm it up in order to get it to uh, a warmer temperature so your body has to create more energy which is going to utilize more fuel that's going to be a small amount but mathematically it definitely is going to uh, play a part now understand something though when doing this if you talk to a dentist they will say if you drink really, really cold water, that can create micro fractures in the enamel of your teeth. So they'll recommend using a straw and drinking through a straw so it doesn't come in direct contact with your teeth. But it's just one of those interesting things that if you were to uh, mathematically calculate, you could figure out that, yeah, there's actually going to be calories spent just from drinking cold water. So the body maintains a state of, en of energy balance. So of course, this falls under homeostasis. And here's, here's something that uh, it doesn't always seem true. Uh, energy input equals uh, its energy output. Weight remains constant when the total calories coming in equals basically the total calories going out is what they're saying here. So if a person wants to lose weight, all they really need to do is eat less and exercise more. That's pretty simple. If they want to maintain, then they keep doing the exercise that they're doing and eat, keep eating the, the, the calories that they're eating. Not, um, and I'm assuming we're talking about healthy calories, by the way. I'm not saying that you can eat anything. But if you want to stay the same, then don't put more fuel in than you need. And you shouldn't want to gain weight. So I'm not going to include that one. But it's actually pretty simple when people talk about uh, weight loss. Overall, it's pretty simple. Eat less and exercise more. And I know there's going to be complications that come with this, whereas people will say, but I, when I try that, I get to a point where um, I sort of plateau. I start to lose a lot of weight very quickly, and then it sort of plateaus. Yeah, because your body's adjusting to that. You might need to adjust um, your training methods or something. But of course, there's going to be the biggest, you're going to see the biggest changes early on. Remember, dieting, fad diets don't do anything. Uh, they're not going to, they're not going to be helpful. Neither is that, what is that waist trainer that they try to sell you? It does not train your waist to do anything. It is just a big wide belt that pushes everything up or down. In starvation, carbohydrates are used up first then fats, then proteins. It's, it's because every, every cell defaults to glucose first. That's the rule. Every cell says, we want glucose, we want glucose. But then when glucose isn't available, some of them are going to quickly switch to the degradation of fats. And the problem with that is there come uh, 
waste products that are created that can actually be somewhat dangerous if they get too high. Well, ketones. Hypothalamus, you remember the hypothalamus is in the diencephalon in the brain, major control center uh, for setting all of the normals uh, in the body. And also, of course, responsible for making a lot of the releasing proteins in the endocrine system. But here we find the appetite center and the satiety center. Tells you when you're full. There's been lots of different, and again, both of these are getting um, a combination of neurological and hormonal feedback. And there's been a lot of research done with this, especially in the satiety center where the questions are, why is it this person eats more than that person? What is it that, that's causing this person to eat a certain amount and saying, okay, that's enough, I'm done, I, I'm not hungry anymore. Whereas somebody else says, oh no, I'm still hungry, I need to eat more. They sound like simple questions, but it's actually pretty complicated as it gets up to the hypothalamus. So there's still a lot of research to be done with this. There's no easy answer on this. I will tell you this, however, and then it's the last one here. I will tell you this, let me come back to your face so you can see my face. There we go. When you eat something, let's say you have a hoagie, cheesesteak, right? Half a cheesesteak. No, whole cheesesteak, whole cheesesteak. Let's say you have a whole cheesesteak for your lunch and you have this whole cheesesteak and a side of cheese fries for your, that sounds really good, for your lunch. Cheesesteak, cheese fries, that's your lunch. And you eat all of that. And when you're done with the last bite, you are full. You can't eat another bite. But then somebody comes over with some chocolate cake or chocolate pie or chocolate sundae or you know what, just anything chocolate. And they say, here, have some of this chocolate stuff. And you're like, okay, well, you know what? Those, those chocolate brownies with the ice cream on top and the hot fudge, that's pretty good. So you start eating that. Not because you're hungry, but because it tastes good. Your stomach, remember we saw the rugae in the stomach that allowed for stretch like an accordion. Your stomach has these stretch receptors that stretch to a certain point, goes from here to here, and it says, you know what, you're full, don't eat any more. What happens, however, is people, when they start eating more and more, their stomach can stretch further, so it resets those stretch points to say, okay, now this is the new normal. This is the new full. So the next time you eat, you have to reach this before you feel full. And then you get to, the person gets to this point, but then they eat some more and they get in the habit of eating a little bit more and eating a little bit more. And they reset those stretch points to saying, okay, now this is the new normal. This is what full looks like. You're gonna keep eating until you reach this point to feel full. So now you heard me say earlier, well, if you want to lose weight, just eat less and exercise more. How do you eat less? Because where you used to be full here and then here and then here, now your nor new normal is here, which means when you eat something and you only eat this much, your stomach only stretches this far, your brain is saying, uh, we haven't reached that, that uh, stretch yet. We're not full yet. 
And it's really difficult to stop eating when you still feel hungry, especially if you ordered that cheesesteak with the side of cheese fries. And now you're saying, well, I'm just going to eat half of that cheesesteak and half of the cheese fries. But your stomach hasn't reached that point yet. So your brain hasn't reached that point yet. So you're still hungry. Here's the toughest part. But, it, but I guarantee you, it happens. If you just stop eating, if you get to that point, you say, that's it. This is, this is where I'm going to stop eating. This is enough food for me right now. I'm not going to eat anymore. Even though your brain's saying, no, you're hungry, you're hungry, you're hungry, you're hungry. If you don't eat more, and then the next day, you only eat half of that sandwich instead of the whole sandwich. And the next day, you only eat half that sandwich instead of the whole sandwich. You're still going to feel hungry for days. But after about a week, which is an amazingly short period of time, but after about a week, what will happen is your stomach will start hitting that new normal. And it will start to say, oh, this is normal. This, this is as much as I need to eat to stay full. And after about a week, you'll start to feel the difference of, I don't have to eat that whole sandwich. I can eat half the sandwich. And now I feel just as full. I guarantee you that will happen. However, I also guarantee you that nine out of 10 people will not make it a week. Uh, eating less food because it's tough. It's really difficult when your brain is still saying you're hungry, when your body's still saying you're hungry, and you're saying, nope, I'm just going to ignore that. That's a really difficult thing to do, which is why a lot of people who try different diets and things like that, uh, they end up not either, either not losing weight or, or gaining weight back. It's a tough thing to do. Uh, if you look at patients with a condition called anorexia nervosa, you may have heard of this before. People sometimes refer to it as anorexia, but that's not correct. Uh, the medical term anorexia actually just means a decreased appetite. So we can't just say that a person has anorexia unless they just have a decreased appetite. All of us at some point in time probably had anorexia, uh, whether it was because we had the flu or uh, maybe just out of surgery, or maybe you had uh, an infectious gastritis where you were throwing stuff up for the last 24 hours or well, not 24 hours, last eight to 10 hours. And you might think, oh God, if I even look at food right now, I, I I'll throw up again. I don't want food. So chances are every one of us has had that happen before where you just didn't have an appetite. Or if, if it's never happened to you, it will at some point, trust me. That's anorexia, a decreased appetite. The mental condition, anorexia nervosa, is when that patient views herself as being fat, doesn't want to be fat, so intentionally does not eat. So her meal for the day will be a spoonful of peanut butter and a diet coke, or three chicken wings, and then some and uh, water, and that'll be it. What people don't understand is her body is still saying, "Oh no, you're hungry." No matter how, how much she's gotten to the point where uh, the stomach stretch receptors are minimal, uh, her body is still saying, no, you're hungry. You need to eat more. And she's just ignoring it. And I say she because anorexia nervosa is predominantly female. Although, yes, there are those males. They are sometimes referred to as manorexia, but um, it is predominantly female. 
And their willpower is amazing that they are doing that. They're ignoring their body. Uh, if, if only they took that willpower and put it into you know, something positive. By the way, that is different from uh, bulimia. Anorexia nervosa, she just refuses to eat. Bulimia, patients who, with bulimia actually like food. They enjoy food. They might even love food, but they don't want things that go along with it, meaning like the, the calories, the extra fat content. Those are the ones who will binge and purge. They will eat a whole box of donuts and then at night get on a treadmill for four and a half hours or eat a whole pizza and then go and throw up or they'll they'll take slices of pizza and they'll chew the slice of pizza but not swallow it they'll spit it out into a napkin or something uh, so they're a little more difficult to spot Anor anorexia nervosa patients they end up looking extremely thin uh, you can everybody knows everyone knows that they have an eating disorder you can just look at them but patients with bulimia, they might be a little um, on the lighter side, a little, little on the thinner side, but they're still within the normal limits. So they're kind of difficult to spot that way. Still not good. They're not doing anything positive for their body. The interesting thing, and I'm getting off topic a little bit about that, but the interesting thing with both of these patients, both the anorexia nervosa and the bulimic patients, they have to have individual therapy. They can't use a group therapy. You know, group therapy works really, really well for things like Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or drug addiction, something like that. Group therapy actually does work well for that but not for patients with eating disorders. They have to be one-on-one -on -one. because if you put a bunch of these women in a group together, they won't be helping one another. They'll be competing against one another. Not, not like out loud, not getting together saying, you know, I'm going to be thinner than you, no, I'm going to be thinner. But in their head, they're going to look around and they say, I want to be thinner than she is. Or they'll, say, you know, this, I, I, I heard that this one over here uses laxatives and this one over here uses the treadmill. Uh, maybe I'll try a combination of those things. So it's, it's not good to put them in group therapy. They have to learn and they have to have individual therapy. It's dangerous. They're anorexia nervosa, especially very dangerous. Okay. Got off topic a little bit uh, there, but um, important stuff to know about. And I do want you to use the terms correctly, uh, anorexia, because you will see that on patients' charts. Elderly patients just coming out of surgery, uh, yeah, they're going to be anorexic. That doesn't mean that they, are, that they don't eat because they want to look good in a swim costume. It means that they have no appetite. So I do want you to know that term, just generally. Any questions? It's a good little chapter on nutrition, although most of it we've actually gone over. Uh, so it's a good little review over that stuff. So I think I'm, I'm probably going to limit uh, if I'm if I put any of that on a test or even on the quiz next week, I'm going to limit it to the stuff that we've already talked about once or twice, even like carbohydrates and uh, fats and triglycerides and ATP. So most of the things, if you see it on a quiz, you see it on a test, will be things that you've heard at least once before. Yeah, that's good. Questions about anything? Nothing. Okay, why don't we do this? Uh, rather than getting started, 
into the urinary system, which is what we're going to do next. Why don't we take a short break? We'll take a break right now. Okay, we are going to get started with the renal system. If you remember, way back, probably week number one or week two or week three or all of the above, I talked about the most important organs in the body. And the most important organ, everyone knows, is the brain. Second most is the heart. Third are going to be the kidneys. And there's reasons for this. Kidneys do a lot with getting rid of the waste products, some of the waste products that we create, especially that nitrogenous waste product. Uh, but they do other things as well. So people don't give the kidneys the credit they deserve. And they deserve quite a bit. They do a lot of things. But remember, if you're thinking, that's a really cool shirt. Where did he get that? Let's check it out below. We'll see. All right. Now that I know that that's in the recording. The main job, main job of the urinary system with the kidneys is to regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the body. That's the main job of the kidneys. Regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the body. They're gonna filter out that nitrogenous waste uh, from the blood. That's a big deal. That's their main job. So let's take a look at the urinary system now. You should be seeing my screen. This is chapter 23. Regulating the composition of blood, removing waste products from the body. So that waste product is in the form of urine. But there's other things in the urine as well. We're also gonna lose some other things that we may not necessarily want to lose, but our body does a pretty good job of trying to regulate those things. So let's take a look at the kidneys. Let's go right to the picture actually first. There are two kidneys. about four inches in length, brownish in color, shaped not surprisingly like a kidney bean. One on the right, there's one on the left. You'll notice that the right kidney, remember it's always the patient's right or left, so the right kidney here is a little bit lower than the left kidney. And the reason for that is because of the liver. So when we are growing in that uterus and we're becoming more and more like an actual person, our body is a lengthening, uh, the kidneys are sort of ascending or moving up, but uh, the right kidney cannot go up quite as high. So left kidney is going to be found at approximately L1, whereas the, sorry, the le yeah, the left kidney is approximately L1, the right kidney is approximately L2. So you have an idea of the difference in height. You'll notice that there's a branch, the renal artery coming off of the aorta to each kidney bringing blood to each kidney. And of course, there's gonna be a renal vein that is going to collect the blood and return it back into the inferior vena cava. There are two 
uh, adrenal glands that are sitting on top of the superior, superior aspects of each kidney. And then coming from each kidney, there is a tube called the ureter. And that tube is going to carry that waste product that we've created now called urine down to a storage container. The storage container is called the urinary bladder. This is going to store it, collect it and store it until we want to get rid of it. And that is going to leave through one tube called the urethra. So you can see the design of this system. It's pretty compact, neatly put together. The kidneys are filtering the blood. They're gonna take the waste product, and just move it down into the storage container. And then when that storage container gets full enough, the body will say, okay, it's time to get rid of it now. So what that means is that the body is constantly filtering the blood and if the blood is constantly being filtered, that means urine is constantly being created. And if urine is constantly being created, it's going to constantly move down through those tubes and store in that bladder until it's time to get rid of it. The kidneys are located in an area we call the retroperitoneal space. Uh, the peritoneum, you remember, is that double layer of membrane uh, in the abdominal cavity. You kind of see it on uh, yeah, the side, okay. So the kidneys are located more in the flank of the back, more towards the back. And what we're looking at here, of course, is we're looking at what you'd see in a CT type of scan. A slice section of the abdomen here. So anytime you see this, anytime you see this type of a scan, realize that you're looking at the person who is flat on their back, unless otherwise described, and you're looking as if you're standing at their feet, looking up through their body towards their head. So we know that this person's on their back because here's a vertebra and the spinous process of that vertebra is on the lower part. And you can see where each kidney is here. And they've labeled them, well, they labeled the left kidney at least, they labeled the right one. And you also see the aorta as it is coming down towards you. And the inferior vena cava is moving up and away. And so like right on top of one another. And the very nice side view here, you can see the location of the kidneys pretty well. Notice the ureters have these sort of bends in them. And they are going to bring that down into the storage site, the urinary bladder. In the male, the urethra is seven to eight inches long, travels the length of the penis, and is unique in that it is going to also carry uh, not just the urine, but also the fluid that transports sperm, as we'll talk about next week. And it also goes through this gland located at the base of the male bladder called the prostate. So the urethra is in the, almost like the center of the prostate that goes through there. In the female, you can see where the urinary bladder is as compared to the uterus. And the uterus is 
right on top here, tilted forward, we call antiflexion. And you also notice the uh, urethra on the female is much shorter, one to two inches long. This is why women are so much more prone to getting urinary tract infections than men because of the short urethra. So any bacteria that happens to be hanging around the urethral meatus, the opening of the urethra, has a very short distance to travel until it makes its way into the bladder. And once it's in the bladder, well, now there's all kinds of places for it to, the bacteria to hide and grow. In the male, if there is any bacteria hanging around the urethral meatus, that's the opening, the meatus, if bacteria tries to ascend all the way up the urethra to get to the bladder, chances are, because it's going to be a longer journey and take longer, chances are that at some point urine is going to come along and flush the bacteria and push it right out. So it's less likely to make that, that journey all the way up. So back to some of the description here. The hilum, the hilum I've talked about before uh, with the lungs, for instance, the hilum is sort of an indented area in the organ where everything either goes into or comes out of an organ. So let's look at this cut section of this kidney right here, first of all. Mm. No, quick, quick look over here. Because we can see the renal artery in red coming in. We can see the renal vein coming out. And then we can also see the ureter. So let's just go back to the ureter part. Ureter image, I should say. All right, so what do we see here? We're looking at this cut section of this kidney. Well, there's an inner part called the medulla. And there's an outer part called the cortex. Oh, cortex. And then there is a fibrous capsule on the outside to maintain the integrity. In other words, to get some strength. And look at inside, there's these sort of, what you're seeing here are these pink kind of triangle shaped areas. And these are called the renal pyramids. They have them marked here as medullary pyramids, but call them the renal pyramids. And they actually are more of a pyramid shape. In other words, they have a wide base that comes kind of to a point. They're not just triangular shaped, they're more pyramid shaped. And it is uh, in part of the cortex and into the medulla where the filtering and uh, reabsorption process occurs. And then the urine is going to travel down collecting ducts to the, towards the tips of these pyramids into the collecting areas here called a calyx, singular, or calyces, plural. So you have some small ones here called minor calyces, which drain into larger ones here called ma a major calyx or major calyces, plural again, which then all are going to drain into this funnel shaped area called the renal pelvis, there is, renal pelvis, 
which is then going to become continuous with the ureter. So the filtering is occurring inside of the cortex and then a bit into the medulla. And reabsorption is also happening in both of these places. And then what is collected was left over is the what we call urine. And that is collected in the minor calluses, which drain into a major calyx, which drains into the funnel-shaped renal pelvis, which drains into the ureter. And we'll see that the ureter, this tube, is a tube that has muscle in its walls. So going back to this image here, uh, let's look at the one on the bottom. You can see the ureters draining down into the urinary bladder. What you need to realize is that this is not a gravity fed system. So urine just isn't flowing down into the bladder because of gravity, like with rainwater down a gutter in your house. It's being propelled, it's being pushed down into the urinary bladder because there is muscle in these walls that is creating a peristaltic action. Remember peristalsis, that wave motion from the muscle. So urine's being propelled down into the bladder which makes sense because if you're lying down, gravity alone wouldn't be enough. So there'll be a backup, we don't want that. Urine's getting pushed down to the bladder. Good stuff to know, just FYI. There's smooth muscle in those walls. Okay. Talk about the calyx, calluses. Um, calyx here. And actually, it can be spelled with an I also. So you might see it both C A L Y X and C A C A L I X. It's an I also. Renal artery brings blood into each kidney. Well, of course it does, because all arteries carry blood away from the heart. So this is going to this is going towards some organ. And renal, of course, reno means kidney, and AL is pertaining to, so pertaining to the kidneys. Then what it's telling you here is it's branching off into these other arteries. I'm not going to get into the difference between the interlobar and interlobular, interlobular and how they're connected by the arcuate arteries, but just know that as the renal artery enters the kidney, what we can see is that it branches off into smaller arteries, which then branch off into smaller arteries, which then branch off into these interlobular small arteries. And then they're going to go to afferent arterioles. This is where the filtering process begins. In the kidneys, which I'm not wrong about. In the kidneys, there is, in each kidney, there's about a million of these things right here. This is called a nephron. This whole structure is called a nephron. And the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. It's what we call the parenchyma of the kidney. So you probably heard about that if you were watching the videos on the final exam review. So parenchyma means functional unit, the functional part. This is where filtration takes place. So let me zoom in here. And what we see 
doesn't really tell us which way the blood's coming in. But what we see is an afferent, we're going to assume this one, an afferent arterial bringing blood to the first part of the nephron called the Bowman's capsule. Now, this is a spear shaped area, sort of ball shaped, and it is hollow otherwise on the inside. And as that afferent arterial bringing blood into here goes into the Bowman's capsule, it branches off into this network of capillaries called the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is where filtration occurs. So blood going through there under the pressure of, of the blood itself, small particles, waste products, some things we want, some things we don't, uh, some water is all gonna get pushed through these little openings in the glomerulus and that will all collect within the Bowman's capsule. And then you can see it sort of rejoins together and it leaves, the artery leaves as the uh, arterial leaves, as the efferent arterial. And we'll see what happens with that in just a little bit. So the filtrate, because we can't call this urine yet, this is just stuff that we filtered out in the Bowman's capsule. That filtrate is collected in the Bowman's capsule and then it's moved along through these different couple of tubes here. Now, the first tube is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Do not get scared away or get nervous because of the name. It looks like a long name, but understand a few things. First of all, tubule simply means a little tube. Kind of like when we talked about cells and we said people have organs that do things, cells also have little parts inside that do things. We just call them organelles, meaning little organs. So tubule is just a fancy way of saying it's a little tube. And then it is convoluted. Convoluted means it has lots of twists and turns. So when you hear someone trying to make up a story about what they were doing and they're trying to not be honest with you, they will come up with a convoluted story it has lots of twists and turns in it. And we know what the term proximal means. It means closer to the starting point. So here we have a tubule that's closer to the starting point and it has lots of twists and turns. So the filtrate, the stuff that was pushed out of that capillary cluster called the glomerulus is collected in the Bowman's capsule, which then that filtrate moves into the proximal convoluted tubule. From there, that filtrate moves down this long part called the loop of Henle. And you can see how some areas are thick, some areas are thin, some areas are going down, some areas are going up. But that whole thing is called the loop of Henley. Then the filtrate moves into another convoluted tubule. But this one is further from the starting point. So it is called the distal convoluted tubule. All of that then empties into a collecting duct, which is this large one that we see here, the collecting duct. And you can see these branches from other the distal convoluted tubules. So now the filtrate, when it enters the collecting duct, now we can say, okay, now we can call this urine. There's a reason why we couldn't call it urine yet until this point. We'll see that in a minute. 
but that collecting duct is going to collect from all of these nephrons that are filtering things out. That collecting duct is going to carry, notice here, you can kind of see we're in the cortex uh, of the kidney moving into the medulla of the kidney. And that collecting duct is then going to go all the way down uh, to, towards the tip of that renal pyramid where it is going to drain into the minor calluses, which is going to drain into a major calyx, then to the renal pelvis, then to the ureter, then to the urinary bladder, then to the urethra, then to the outside world. So that whole thing from the Bowman's capsule to the end of the collecting, uh, the distal convoluted tube, or what it means to collect them, but that is called a nephron. And again, each kidney has about a million of these. Nice image here of what that uh, glomerulus would look like inside of the Bowman's capsule. So let's look at this nephron here. We know that we have an afferent arterial that's going to bring blood into, into the Bowman's capsule and become the, uh, become the glomerulus inside. Then we're gonna have an efferent arterial where it comes back together and leaves the Bowman's capsule. And you'll notice that that efferent arterial then sort of wraps around here, the different parts of the proximal convoluted tubule. And you'll even see there'll be areas where it wraps around of the loop of Henle and even maybe a little bit onto the distal convoluted tubule. The reason for this is because when we filter stuff out, back here in this, in the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule, when we're filtering things out of our blood, we are actually going to lose a lot of stuff that we don't want to lose. We are going to lose things like water. We are going to filter out a huge amount of water. I think I made this comparison before, just like a swimming pool that you might have in your backyard. It's connected to a filter. Water leaves the swimming pool, goes through the pipes, goes through the filter, the filter stops particles like dirt or sticks or leaves. And then the water goes through pipes back into the pool again, thereby cleaning the water. Now, of course, there's gonna be some water that's gonna be left behind in the, in the filter, some gonna be left behind in the pipes, but a small amount. Most of it's going to return back into the pool again. Well, when we filter our blood, a lot of water gets lost. We filter out a huge amount of water, <laughs> pardon me, but we want to get that water back, back into the blood, let's say back into the system. So we have these areas where that efferent arterial wraps around the nephron and is in contact with that, in this case, proximal convoluted tubule. So that things like water can get reabsorbed back into the blood. Now, how would that happen? If you remember the endocrine system, we talked about a hormone called the antidiuretic hormone or ADH. And the antidiuretic hormone 
is going to open up water channels and cause water to get reabsorbed back into the blood. So about 95% of the water that we just lost, we are going to reabsorb again. That's pretty good. That's what we want. Then we also have the ability to absorb other things like sodium. We lost some sodium, we wanna bring it back in. We can reabsorb it here. And you'll remember the hormone that helps with that is aldosterone. Aldosterone helps to reabsorb that sodium back into the blood. And of course, if you move salt into blood, water's gonna follow that. We even have the ability to still filter out some things. So there's still a possibility that stuff can go the other way as well. We can get rid of some more waste products if we need to. But that's the reason why that nephron has all these different parts to it, these different twists and turns. That's going to allow for these, this efferent arterial to come in contact with these areas and reabsorb some of those things that we lost. So this is the complicated part. When I talk about the urinary system being a nice compact anatomical design, uh, but the physiology getting a little more complicated, this is the area where it's getting a little more complicated. So I'm trying to just make it as simple as possible. All right. Ureter, the ureter. Ureter, lined with epithelium, of course, because epithelial tissue is, is always a lining, but there's, or covering, but there's also gonna be a mucus lining, which kind of makes sense, even though it's not a direct to the outside world, it's somewhat direct. Not to mention the acidity of the urine coming through. Uh, these ureters could be a bit damaging to the cells. So we could all buffer that. And there's a smooth muscle inner lining. So when you looked at that tube called the ureter, your first thought might be, oh, it kind of looks like it would be a, like a garden hose kind of tube with a big round opening in the middle. But you can actually see the opening kind of look like the star shape. That is the lumen of the ureter. It is, of course, smooth muscle that's going to propel that urine down to the bladder. Because smooth muscle is involuntary, meaning we don't have to think about it. It's going to get pushed down all its own. Smooth muscle. Down to the urinary bladder. The wall of the bladder, mostly made of smooth muscle, because it's going to help push the urine out. There are See if you can see it here. You can see one ureter coming down this way and emptying into the bladder here, and the one from the left coming down, entering into the bladder here, the opening. And then you can see there's one opening where the urine is eventually going to leave the bladder. So if you kind of connected those dots, these openings, opening, opening, and opening. It creates this triangular shaped area called the trigon, the trigon. And that is just a little different uh, than the rest of the interior of the urinary bladder. You can see inside of the urinary bladder, there's a lot of those folds, just like we saw in the stomach that are going to allow for expansion so it can hold more, 
We're going to expand like an accordion. The rounded dome shaped part of the bladder, although it's not on here, is called the fundus, which is the same thing that we saw with the rounded dome shaped part of the stomach, also called the fundus. See the detressor is the smooth muscle, the main one of the main smooth muscle that's going to push urine out. Okay. So why doesn't urine just leak right out of that opening at the bottom of the bladder? Well, because there's a muscular doorway, and in fact, there's two of them. A muscular doorway is referred to as a sphincter. We saw some of that back when we were talking about the uh, junction between the esophagus and the stomach. Remember, there's the lower esophageal sphincter. That is going to uh, tighten up so that food and acid does not move backwards up in the esophagus. At least that's the idea. Uh, the pyloric sphincter is at the other end of the stomach. It is going to keep things from moving out of the stomach too soon. So here we have two urethral sphincters, an internal and an exter oops, external. There's two muscular doorways. The thing is, we only have control over the one. We only have control over the external urethral sphincter. The internal urethral sphincter is under involuntary control. So when the bladder says it's time to release that urine, well, that sphincter, that internal urethral sphincter, that muscle just relaxes, that's it. And that is going to cause that urine to start to wanna to leave. So it is only that second doorway, that external, external urethral sphincter, where you actually have control. Which, as you know, is pretty important to have. You'll also notice that this is a male image because there is a prostate gland. The prostate gland is a walnut size and walnut shaped gland just beneath the male bladder. It is going to contribute to some of that fluid that I talked about earlier, we'll see next week, uh, that carries the sperm. We'll talk about that in the male reproductive system next week. So the part of the urethra that goes through this is called the prostatic urethra. There's also going to be uh, a connector for that secondary fluid right in the prostate that hook that goes right into the urethra. So that's called the ejaculatory duct, but we'll talk about that next week as well. Uh, I don't want to talk about the bulbal urethral glands just yet. They're sometimes called Cowper's gland, so you might see it as that as well. Uh, but the bubble urethral glands, so I guess I can talk about them quickly because they, they are kind of important and I will say that there's something that you might be a bit familiar with. You may, you may have kind of, you may kind of understand what they do. Let's put it that way. So the male urethra is unique because it carries urine, of course, but it also carries that fluid that transports sperm. So it has a dual purpose. But urine is very acidic. It has a lower pH. 
So if there are any tiny droplets of urine still found inside of the urethra, as that other fluid is coming through carrying the spermatozoa, the sperm cell, if there is any urine droplets in that urethra, the acidity from that can be damaging to the sperm cells. So there's got to be some way to kind of neutralize that area first. So what the body does, the bulbourethral glands, are going to first release this fluid ahead of the sperm to neutralize that urethra as it runs the length of the penis. That fluid is from the bulbourethral glands is often referred to as pre-ejaculate, although I know you probably have heard other terminology to describe it. That's the purpose of that pre-ejaculate fluid. It comes from the bulbourethral glands, these little pea-sized glands here, and it is going to send that fluid along so as to neutralize the urethra so that any acidity from droplets of urine that might still be in the urethra are not damaging to sperm. So that only took a few minutes to go over, so that's fine. So we'll see the bulb urethral glands again next week when we discuss the male and female reproductive systems. The urethra. Again, males, it's unique. Goes through the prostate gland. It also carries the fluid that carries the sperm. It is seven to eight inches long in the male. It is about one to two inches long in the female. This is why we always recommend that a female will, should empty her bladder post coitus because any bacteria that may have gotten pushed up into the urethra a little bit can get flushed out. What else about the urethra? Oh, of course. Of course, there's going to be a mucus lining. Because the urethra is an opening to the outside world. Remember, our skin is our primary immune barrier. But everywhere in our body where we have an opening to the outside world, we are going to have some sort of mucus lining that is going to create sticky mucus to trap things. So it should, should come as no surprise that there is a mucus membrane here. Uh, and although not listed on this slide, we saw it earlier, the opening to the urethra is called the urethral meatus, or in the book, I think they call it the urinary meatus. Meatus is spelled M-E-A-T-U-S. It looks like meatus. You want to say meatus. It is pronounced meatus, and it is an opening. So you see that in other areas of the body as well. Micturition, also known as voiding, also known as urinating, 
also known as a bunch of other terms. The trestle muscle of the bladder is going to squeeze. The urethral sphincter is going to relax. Initially, the internal one relaxes. You don't have control over that one. And it is only when the external urethral sphincter uh, relaxes that allows for urine to move on out to the outside world. There is often bacteria right around the opening of the urethral meatus. Not surprising considering the general vicinity. So if we want to get a urine specimen, we want someone to pee in a cup, there is a way to uh, use a betadine wipe to wipe this area first to get rid of any bacteria that might be there. However, something that is simpler to do is what we call a clean catch or a midstream catch. We have the person with their, give them their cup, tell them to go into the bathroom and you say, start to pee and then shove that cup into the stream. The reason you want to start them peeing is because any bacteria that's right around the opening, we don't want to go into that cup because that could skew our results. It could make it look like they have a urinary tract infection when they don't. In other words, it looks like there's bacteria in their bladder, but it's not. So we want to have them pee first. So it pushes that bacteria out of the way and then shove the cup into the stream. If it's a young boy, just put the cup on the floor and say, hit your target. Because at first they won't. Eventually, well, of course, it'll make a mess, but it's effective. Okay, what else do I want to say about that? On a baby, we can actually attach a little bag. That would definitely have to um, use a betadine wipe for first. And there's a bag that has a little bit of a sticky area that you can peel off and, and stick on to the uh, baby's pelvis and uh, just like fill up the bag. Or you can do a suprapubic puncture. So you get a needle and just stick it right through their ab right through their uh, abdominal pelvic wall, right into their bladder above the pubic bone. And just get the urine directly out of the bladder that way. That's yeah, effective. What else do I want to say about that? Let's see. Isn't that more invasive than a stray cat? Yep. But it's fast. Fast and clean. Any anytime we and again, no, it's either once a painful though. Um, anytime we put a catheter in, we want to use a sterile technique because we greatly increase the chance of pushing bacteria up into the bladder. So when we do see men with urinary tract infections, it's often uh, older men who have like a large prostate or someone who has, has had a catheter put in. Because even though you're trying your best to use a sterile technique, there's still that one, there's still the possibility that you're pushing bacteria up. And two, now you've just created a ladder basically for the bacteria to climb right up into the bladder. So it definitely increases the chance of urinary tract infection that way. Straight catheters are good for quickly emptying the bladder too. 
if you're going to do uh, a surgical procedure and they're like taking out a uterus or something. Then you want to quickly empty the bladder. What else? Or something else. I'm going to say with the urethra. I have lost it. Well, maybe it'll come back to me. Okay. Talked about the nephron. So the nephron is the parenchyma. It is the functional unit of the kidney. This is the for the filtration and reabsorption that takes place. Starting with filtration within that Bowman's capsule. As we saw here. Now you'll also notice where are we? This part here, the juxtaglomerular apparatus. made up of juxtaglomerular cells, sometimes just called JG cells, that's shorter. This is an important little area because you'll notice we have an afferent arterial coming in to the Bowman's capsule right there at that juxtaglomerular apparatus. And as that afferent arterial goes in, it branches off into this network of capillaries called the glomerulus. So we have blood that has come from the renal artery uh, through the interlobar, arcuate, interlobular arteries, eventually to this afferent arterial. So there are in the JG cells, pressure sensing cells that can determine if there is high or low pressure in the blood as it's coming in here. And if the blood pressure is low, those juxtaglomerular cells will release a substance called renin. And I'll sort of draw this out a little bit later. We'll see it again. And the renin then activates something called angiotensinogen, which is then converted to angiotensin 1, which goes to the lungs and is converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs using the angiotensin converting enzyme. And then angiotensin 2 initially increases peripheral resistance, which is going to raise blood pressure. And secondarily, it causes uh, the release of aldosterone, which is going to cause salt to be reabsorbed, which then is going to bring water in, which is going to increase blood volume, which is going to increase blood pressure. So one of the other things that the kidneys do is help to regulate blood pressure. And most people don't think of the kidneys as doing much more than just making pee but they actually have a really important role in blood pressure regulation. And they do that through things like, one, through the reabsorption of water, the ADH, and then two, with this system here, um, called the renin-angiotensin system, although I think in the textbook they call it the renin-angiotensinogen-angiotensin system. The reason I'm mentioning this to you, because you might say that sounds really complicated. Why is he going into all this detail? Well, there's a reason for that. When we want to control a patient's blood pressure, we control it by either altering the resistance or altering the volume in the blood, just like the body alters blood pressure. And one category of medications that is used very, very commonly, and it works really, really well, are called ACE inhibitors. 
ACE inhibitors. And the ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. So it stops that conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two that occurs in the lungs. And again, I'm gonna draw this out a little bit later on because I want you to see the overall picture. I want you to see how it regulates blood pressure. And I want you to see how we use medications to interfere with that. Because if we can stop that from happening, it'll keep the blood pressure lower. And of course, that would be good for the patient in this sense. But it, it shows how the kidneys do a lot more than simply making urine. They play a role in blood pressure regulation. Now, you know that's a big deal, and you can start to see why now we're going to put it into that category of third most important organ in the body, or organs in this case, in the body. Hopefully. The glomerulus, again, is that network of capillaries that branch off of that afferent arterial that is inside of the Bowman's capsule. And the glomerulus has lots of little tiny openings that's going to allow for things that are small to get pushed through called fenestrations. You can see that term there, fenestrations, these little tiny openings. So anything that's too big to go through there is just going to remain in the blood and keep moving through as the glomerulus reforms into that efferent arterial as it leaves uh, the Bowman's capsule. So the filtrate is collected in the Bowman's capsule. Then it moves to the proximal convoluted tubule. Then down into that long loop of Henle stretching all the way down into the medulla. Then back as the distal convoluted tubule. So the filtrate that is going through there is still called filtrate because throughout this course from the proximal convoluted tubule to the loop of Henle to the distal convoluted tubule, the body still has the ability to reabsorb stuff that it has lost and even a small amount of filtration still to get rid of other things that are not necessary. So it's not until it meets that collecting duct do we actually call it urine. So once it goes there, then we lose that. Okay. There's the juxtable barrier. We talked about that. We're not really going to worry as much about the type of nephrons, just know that this is what nephrons do. Chief function. Mm. Yeah, perfect. Uh, a little ahead of schedule, but that's okay. And we'll stop here. I want to stop here because we're going to start seeing the other uh, functions of the kidneys. So let's take a break right now. I'll see you back here in about two seconds. Okay, we are back and I am going to start with just my own little addition here. So you should be able to see my screen uh, right about now. All right. Uh, we'll get rid of that. This, this part of that. Okay. So we know that the main function of the kidneys and the urinary system is to regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the body. But what else do kidneys do? Well, take a look at that other function. 
Jesus. Of the kidneys. First one. Blood pressure. Regulation. So how does that happen? Well, with the antidiuretic hormone, ADH, that is going to open up water channels and allow water to be reabsorbed back into the system, that is going to increase blood volume, which is going to increase blood pressure. Salt can be reabsorbed with the help of aldosterone. If salt is reabsorbed, that is going to cause water to be reabsorbed because water follows salt. And if water is reabsorbed again, then that's going to increase volume again, and that's going to increase blood pressure. And as I mentioned before, and I'll go through this uh, in a more detail in a few minutes, if the kidneys sense that the, that the blood pressure is low, then the kidneys will release a substance called renin, and then renin will activate angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen will then be converted to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will go to the lungs where it is converted to angiotensin 2 with the help of the angiotensin converting enzyme. And then angiotensin 2 will go out and increase peripheral resistance and if you increase resistance, that means there's going to you can, uh, see a decrease in the size of a lumen, for instance, in an artery. If you decrease the size of the lumen, that's going to increase blood pressure. And then secondarily, it causes the release of aldosterone, which is then going to cause salt to be reabsorbed, causing water to be reabsorbed, and increasing blood volume. So in those ways, kidneys can regulate blood pressure. Another function of the kidneys regulate blood pH. Remember, the pH of the blood should be right around 7.4. But if the blood starts to get a little bit acidic, in other words, the pH starts to go down, that's not good, but we can regulate that by increasing the amount of bicarbonate. And the kidneys can make they can make bicarbonate H C O three minus through a process called de novo synthesis which is a really fancy way of saying um, by, from scratch. They can make it from scratch. They can make bicarbonate from scratch. And what that's going to do, that is going to help raise the blood pH. That's a pretty important thing. And then the third of these other functions of the kidneys they can regulate red blood cell 
production. And the way they do this is with a hormone called erythrocoetin. G-O-I-E-T-I-N, the erythropoietin. This is going to go to the bone marrow, especially that red bone marrow. And it will tell the bone marrow to make more red blood cells and take the ones that you've begun to make and mature them faster. Remember how I'd shown you before that the, uh, the hematopoietic pluripotential stem cell was capable of becoming any cell that it needed, any blood cell it needed to become. All you had to do was tell it to become that cell. And it goes through that, uh, that process of changing uh, and changing and changing and changing until it becomes that particular cell. So erythropoietin tells the bone marrow, specifically those hematopoietic pluripotential stem cells, you need to become mature red blood cells. So make some more red cells and take the ones that you've already started to make and make them faster. Get them into full production mode. So these are other functions of the kidneys. Remember the main function of the kidney is to regulate the composition of blood and remove waste products from the body. But these are other functions of the kidneys. So let me show you this somewhat complicated uh, description of altering blood pressure. kidney is going to release substance called renin. Renin is going to activate angiotenosin. Angiotenosin is going to get converted to angiotensin one, which then goes to uh, the lungs. It's a lung. Where it is converted Angio, oops, there's, there's an S in there. Angiotensin two, which then increases, increases. Resistance and then it 
causes the release of aldosterone. Both of these are going to increase blood pressure. So let's put, let's see here, blue. There is here the Angio tensin converting enzyme. ACE. Okay. So you see how the kidneys through this process are eventually going to cause the increase in blood pressure. If those juxtaglomerular cells sense the blood pressure is low, they release renin. Renin, is, uh, renin causes the release of angiotensin. Mm, so that wrong, sorry. Renin causes the, then causes the release of angiotensinogen which then is converted to angiotensin one. There is an S in there, angiotensin one. Angiotensin one goes to the lungs where it's converted to angiotensin two using the angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin two then goes on to increase peripheral resistance and cause the release of aldosterone, which is gonna cause salt to be reabsorbed in the water, therefore to be reabsorbed. Both of these things increasing blood pressure so if we had a patient who had high blood pressure, we can give them medications called ACE inhibitors. It will block this from doing its job which means angiotensin one will never get converted to angiotensin two, which means peripheral resistance won't increase, which means won't be that release of aldosterone, which means blood pressure won't go up. In other words, it'll help them keep a lower blood pressure. And these are the prills. Like lisinopril or captopril, these are the ACE inhibitors. And these are one of the really go-to blood pressure lowering medications because it does work at these two different levels uh, with decreasing peripheral resistance and decreasing increase of blood volume. So they're used really, they're used frequently and they're used with a great deal of success, the captopril. The, the prills, we'll call it, the ACE inhibitors. So their uh, side effect is gonna come back to this here, angiotensin one, because remember the kidneys are still gonna release renin. They're, that's still gonna, get, um, still gonna cause the activation of angiotensinogen which is still gonna get converted to angiotensin one, which is still gonna go to the lungs, but then it doesn't get converted. So what the patient ends up with is a whole bunch of angiotensin one collecting in their lungs, which can be irritating. So you'll often hear them sort of doing this, <clears throat> trying to <clears throat> clear their throat. They always seem like they have a, <clears throat> like they're always trying to, <clears throat> clear their throat. So it does cause a little bit of an irritation there. If it gets bad enough, they, then the doctor can switch to something else. But, you know, the first line of blood pressure medications is usually the benign 
products, things like hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, uh, that water pill is usually the first thing that somebody's going to get um, if they're if they've just been diagnosed with high blood pressure. But it's not it's not uncommon for them later to go on uh, one of these ACE inhibitors because it does work just so very well. So you'll hear about ACE inhibitors a lot. And again, you're going to deal with patients who have high blood pressure a lot. You're going to see that a lot. So you're going to see those medications. Uh, that and the, probably the beta blockers would be the next ones. And the beta blockers are going to have a dual effect. They're going to decrease blood pressure. And they're also going to decrease heart rate to a certain extent as well, which is, again, beneficial. They just work a little differently. They decrease contractility of the heart so that it's not as forceful of a contraction. Anyway, so I digress. So this is the renin angiotensin system, although I think they now call it the renin angiotensinogen angiotensin system, something like that. Am I gonna test you on this? Yeah, I am. Probably not in this much detail. Uh, what I would definitely want you to know about, I will circle in yellow. Yellow is green. The renin part that starts this whole process. Maybe the ACE part as well. Happening in the lungs, angiotensin converting enzyme. But definitely the renin part that starts this process. But no, you do not have to know all these different steps and what converts to what. And that would just, that's kind of unnecessary. All right, I think I already included the idea. I already did the ear throat poet. I'm not going to do that. All right. No. I want to stop all this. There's other things the kidneys do as well. I think we're getting to that a little bit, a little bit later on here. Notice on. Um, the second one down here, nitrogenous wastes from protein metabolism. If you remember, you probably heard me say a couple of times that we make two things more than anything else. We make energy, and we make proteins. And you might even recall that I told you that when we make proteins, it's usually because we've taken proteins and we break them down and then we build them back up in other proteins. So there's a lot of protein metabolism occurring in our cells. And because there's a lot of protein metabolism occurring, there's gonna be a lot of this nitrogenous waste that's created. Originally, it's created as ammonia. And then in the liver, this waste, this ammonia waste, combines with carbon dioxide and something called amylase phosphate synthase one, creates something brand new, which is then eventually going to create several other new things or several steps involved in this called the urea cycle, which eventually creates urea. Urea is the nitrogenous waste that we are going to get rid of, that we are going to pee out. 
So urea can then go to the kidneys and get removed that way. So just, just as a reminder, we make two things more than anything else, energy and proteins. And when we're making those things, we're going to create waste products. And the nitrogenous waste is from that, a lot of it is from that protein uh, building and breaking down and breaking down and building up again. And then you can see here the effects of, uh, well, I shouldn't say the effects. The inclusion of the antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone uh, that are happening, that are occurring at the level of the kidneys to cause these other things to happen. Um, this is something that a lot of people aren't as familiar with. That they, most people, many people are aware that our skin uh, has a type of vitamin D that is activated by sunlight. So we have to, uh, we have to get a certain amount of sunlight every day or every week at least to activate this vitamin D to make it usable. But our kidneys can also make vitamin D to a certain extent. So it helps in the process of making the vitamin D so that our bones can absorb calcium so that they can be nice and solid and strong. Uh, and then here it talks about the functions of the nephron. We are going to mainly be filtering things out in that Bowman's capsule, but we are also going to lose a lot, like water and some other things that we might want back. So in the tubes, we are going to have the ability to reabsorb a lot of those things. Plus, there's a small ability to also still filter things out. In other words, still take some things that we didn't want and move them into the blood or move them out of the blood and into the tubes. Filtration is something that does not require any sort of energy input. We talked about this again, this couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, we talked about transport. And we said there's two main types of transport, active transport and passive transport. Active transport requires some sort of energy input. Passive transport does not. And we, I think the examples I gave was uh, diffusion and osmosis as passive transports. They do not require any energy input. Filtration that is occurring here also does not require any energy input. This is not an active process. It is simply driven by the size of the particles and the force of the blood. I mean, size of the particles relative to the fenestrations, the openings in the glomerulus. And of course, the blood pressure is what's going to help push those things across. About 95% of the water that we lose gets reabsorbed. We talked about some of these things already. Too much about this. This is where it gets uh, a little bit involved. Well, it's already got a little bit involved, but I think I just want you to have the general idea that each of these different areas proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, 
distal convoluted tubule. Each of these areas, oops, yeah, has the ability to reabsorb certain things in different parts of them. So they're kind of specific for that. And again, that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. Talked about antidiuretic hormone. Uh, I mentioned the atrial natriuretic hormone a long time ago when we talked about in the endocrine system, but I'm not gonna go into too much now. Composition of urine, even though we reabsorb about 95% of the water that is originally lost, still urine is made up of mostly water, easily 90, 95%. Then it has some of these other things in there. Now, this is under normal circumstances, we're gonna find these other things, uh, most of these other things. And then of course, towards the end there, you can see, there's always the potential to find other stuff like red blood cells or white blood cells, things that really shouldn't be there. Um, when it says hormones, it can also mean like the breakdown product of hormones that can be released as well. We know what electrolytes are. These are things that can be dissociated to ions and, and a fluid that are gonna have some sort of positive or negative charge to them. So we've talked about electrolytes already. Normal values of total body water. Yeah. I would say in an average adult, definitely on the high side, sort of that 75%. And of course, there's other things that can uh, lead to it as well. Things like pathological reason, like uh, missions with the heart or pregnancy. Remember, she's going to gain, oops, she's going to gain 30, between 30 and 40, even up to 50% of uh, increase in blood when she's pregnant, which means that's a big increase in fluid. This goes, this goes back to, I think the, the chapter on tissues or the chapter on cells. Okay, extracellular fluid, in other words, the fluid that is not cytoplasm, not inside of the cell. So of course, that's gonna include the plasma portion of blood, uh, the fluid that's around the cells, known as interstitial fluid, the lymph, which is the fluid that carries around uh, particles, including white blood cells and waste particles uh, in the lymphatic system. Cerebrospinal fluid, that's the fluid that circulates around the brain and spinal cord delivering nutrients. Synovial fluids in the joints. And the fluid like the vitreous humor or the aqueous humor uh, that we find in the eyes. So you can see intracellular fluid is all the fluid that's inside of the cell, makes sense. And then the extracellular fluid. So this is showing, like uh, if you look at all the fluid in our body, at any given time, most of the fluid is actually inside of our cells. Which is amazing to consider.
extracellular um, extracellular versus intracellular fluids. One thing that we'll find is that the fluid portion of blood, the plasma, and the fluid that sits around the cells is almost exactly the same because it has to be. That's where a lot of movement of nutrients is gonna take place and movement of waste products. Uh, so they're gonna be in the sort of the same balance. And they're gonna have sort of the same amount of solid particles and uh, see even some of the same types of solid particles. This is one of the reasons why we cannot change uh, the viscosity of the blood. Viscosity means the thickness. If we change the viscosity of the blood, it would change the viscosity of the fluid that sits around the cells. Now, we know that through osmosis, if we change that viscosity, if we took out solid particles, uh, then that, that would cause there to be a shift in the fluid from the uh, extracellular interstitial fluid toward the inside of the cell, which would cause cells to fill up with more fluid and swell. This goes way back, this goes back to uh, the fact that blood thinners don't actually thin the blood. If we tried to do that, if we tried to alter the viscosity of the blood to what was in the body, uh, that would alter the viscosity of the interstitial fluid. And in doing so, that would change a shift in the fluid from going around the cells to actually into the cells, which would cause cells to swell and lice pop, which wouldn't be good. For those who care. I don't know. That's actually just what I was talking about. Okay, how does water get into the body? Can water move across your skin from the outside to the inside? Actually, it can to a very small, small amount. Uh, the skin is very, very selectively permeable. Water it doesn't move a lot. We cannot absorb a lot of water through our skin. We cannot lose a lot of water through our skin. I mean, other than sweat, that's different. Those are coming from sweat glands. But we do actually have the ability to move a little bit of water in or out, depending upon the environment that we're in. Most water enters the body through the things that we drink and the things that we eat. There's a lot of water in the foods that we eat. Good example would be a banana. And I think I've used this example before actually, but uh, if you look at a banana, um, it looks a lot different when you cut it up into small pieces and dehydrate those small pieces. You may have sometime in your life had banana chips, uh, tasty, sweet little chips, crunchy little banana chips as a snack. The problem is they're really not healthy as a snack. Because now that you've taken the water out, you've just condensed them into small little pellets of sugar. And in order to eat some of those and feel full, you would have to eat a lot of them. Because the banana with its water content will actually make you feel fuller. So if you ate just a regular banana, that might be enough to fill you up. But if you wanted to be the same amount of full, uh, you might have to eat three bananas worth of banana chips to get that same feeling. And that means you're getting a lot more of the sugar, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But there's a lot of, um, a lot of water in, in many of the foods that we eat. So that adds to it quite a bit. 
how do we leave? How does, try that again. How does water leave the body? Everyone should be immediately thinking, well, we pee out a lot of water. Yes, you're right, we do. Sweat. We sweat out a lot of water. Absolutely, depending upon you know the, the ambient temperature and what we're doing. We breathe out water. And we breathe out water all of the time. You just don't know it or notice it unless you are someplace where it's really, really cold outside and you breathe and you say, hey, I can see my breath. But this is also why you can go over inside of the house where it's you know comfortable and breathe on a mirror and create that little fog on a mirror. You breathe out water. And then a lot of water is actually lost in feces as well. Of course, if, uh, if someone is sick, they're going to lose a lot of water through vomiting or diarrhea or both, depending on what they have. And that water is important because in order to make energy, we have to have three main ingredients, glucose, oxygen, and some water. So if we don't have water, we can't make energy. And when we can't make energy, things start to slow down. And when things start to slow down, then things start to die. Cells die, tissues die. Organs die, organ systems die, organisms die. You get the idea. Oh, they call it the Renan. There's two. I thought there was one N in Renan. Let's spell that. That can't be right. Renan had one N. Yeah, Renan has one N, R-E-N-I-N. -N. See if there's an alternate spelling for it. It doesn't look like it. All right, I thought I spelled that right. So here they're calling it the Renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which I guess is fine too. Uh, I always just call it the renin angiotensin system because, well, there's of course a lot more to it. But again, helps to control uh, blood pressure via those two mechanisms, peripheral resistance, as well as uh, the absorption of salt, which is going to also bring water into the system. Okay, I guess that's kind of interesting. Under normal conditions, homeostasis of total volume of water in the body is maintained or restored primarily by adjusting urine volume and secondary, secondarily by fluid intake. So in other words, um, if your body thinks you need to hold on to some water, it will release more ADH and that will bring more water or open more water channels, bring more water back into the system. Unless of course you have in some way blocked ADH from doing its job, like ingesting things with caffeine or ethanol. That will do that. Cause those channels not to open, cause the person to pee out more water, become dehydrated. One thing that'll happen, 
if someone is working outside uh, on one of those really hot days where we have 96 degree temperatures, 94 degree temperatures, 100% humidity, and they're all day deciding to get the lawn work done and, and landscaping and everything, uh, you'll notice they'll sweat and they'll sweat and they'll sweat. When they stop sweating, that's when it's dangerous. When their body says, okay, we've lost too much water, we need to stop sweating. That's when they start entering, um, going from heat, going into heat exhaustion. Right, make sure I get that right. Yeah, I think it's heat exhaustion. The person will start getting severe cramps uh, in their muscles, they'll throw up. That's when they're moving from heat exhaustion into heat stroke, that's what it is. They're moving from heat exhaustion to heat stroke. And that can be actually deadly. So their body temperature is gonna obviously go up if they're not sweating anymore, but they're still in the heat, uh, heated environment and they're still uh, doing, doing a lot of work. I got on that, but it's interesting if you see people who've gone through this uh, where they've had maybe like dark clothing on, like dark jeans or something, a dark t shirt. After a while, you'll start to see like where they were sweating and then stopped and sweating and stopped. You'll see these areas that are just collecting the salt. Uh, in their sweat and you gotta think man this person better jump in a pool here we gotta get them some gatorade we gotta cool them down quickly okay oh no. okay regulation of urine volume <coughs> determined by the glomerular filtration rate You'll hear a lot about GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, and that is, just as it sounds, how much uh, fluid is going through the glomerulus and how much of that is leaving as urine. You can see that in patients who are on IV fluids and they have a catheter in, you can literally monitor how much fluid is going into their body. Uh, and how much is coming out. And that, you can get a good calculation, easy calculation of the glomerular filtration rate. All right, we talked about some of that stuff already. Well, we know about the plasma membrane. Talked about that, changing the sodium potassium. Talked about that already. Uh, again, this is all about altering those solid particles, those solutes. Try not to get too deep into that. That's actually a good thing to, to realize also. Uh, if sodium is getting low, the kidneys will notice that too. So they'll uh, either, there'll be an increase in the absorption of sodium uh, at the level of the kidneys with aldosterone. So that's kind of an interesting note. Chloride, well, wherever sodium goes, chloride follows. Uh, and notice here that chloride ions are usually excreted in the urine as potassium salt. So you can also think of these two going together as well. And notice the hypokalemia. You'll see this 
uh, from time to time. Remember, uh, potassium is represented by the K on the periodic table of the elements. So hypokalemia, low potassium, that is going to affect uh, the heart. Either way, actually, high potassium or low potassium is going to, is going to affect the heart and how it contracts. That's actually how uh, they kill people with lethal injection, putting that excess amount of potassium on the outside of the cell membrane doesn't allow the, the cell to reset. So those cells that contract that need to reset don't. And then next, next contraction doesn't happen. The heart stops. All right, so I talked a little bit about pH already. I'm not gonna talk more about that. Uh, like I said, our blood should be right around 7.4 approximately. Notice here, they're saying in the uh, intracellular fluid is right about seven. It's almost exactly the same as water. But arterial blood is right around 7.4. So a little bit less or a little bit more puts, puts them into an acidotic or an alkalotic state. So acidotic is pretty easy to crack with that bicarbonate. That's exactly what will happen. But again, we've talked about that already. We've already talked about the pH scale. I don't think I'm gonna go into that any more. Well, no. All right, I think that's about what I wanted to do. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Questions? I know I skipped over some of the physiology because the physiology can get complicated. And if, uh, again, if this were an advanced anatomy class, like when I teach the paramedics, this is one of the areas where I would spend more time. I would teach them more of the physiology part of this uh, than the anatomy part. Because the anatomy, anatomy part is pretty simple and straightforward. But the physiology, they really need to understand that a lot more uh, when making decisions about patients. So I think we're good what we covered. Even though the renin angiotensin system might be a little bit complicated and a little bit more than you need, a little more in depth than you need to go with it. That's one of the ones that I do like to include a bit simply because of its effect on you know, the use of blood pressure medications to alter the effects of that, uh, of that system. And it is something that you are absolutely gonna come across. So that's why I wanted to include that in there. Anyone have questions? No. Okay. Well, it's pretty close, just about two o'clock. Uh, and you have that quiz coming up now or the next few minutes. So why don't you get ready for your quiz? And we'll call it a day. Which means that we only have one more lecture day after this. We only have one more lecture day left of anatomy and physiology. How sad is that? All right, so I'm going to end this now. Uh, and remember to check out the links below. Leave a comment, like, subscribe. See you another time.